The Mises Institute is making Dr. Ron Paul's monograph, Gold, Peace, and Prosperity, available for free to our podcast listeners. This quick read covers the history of monetary destruction and makes a case for sound money. Get your free copy at Mises.org slash HAPod free. This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. David, welcome to the Human Action Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Well, sure thing. So uh, you're here to discuss your new book. Maybe you can hold that up for the people who are watching the video version of this. Sure. It's on FDR, the New Deal's War on the Bill of Rights. Um, so maybe the first thing you can explain is, so I, I have a book, the politically incorrect guide to the great depression, the new deal. And I touched on this kind of stuff, but yeah, I just scratched the surface when I was going in and it's the, the conventional wisdom is that FDR was a great leader. Of course, he led us through world war two and the new and the great depression. And the one asterisk is, oh yeah, well, there was the whole Japanese internment camp thing, but I think most Americans don't even really know what that was. And anyway, it wasn't FDR's fault, and he was probably pressured into doing it. So you're here to set the record straight. Yeah, that's exactly the way it's treated. Sometimes a little bit more subtle than that. People will say, well, you know, he shouldn't have done it. But, and the buts include claims that there was massive uh, public pressure for him to do it, uh, that he, one of my favorites is that he was distracted uh, you know, you get arguments like that and, and those arguments don't really hold water at all. Um, can, can you so, elaborate uh, on the distracted? Yeah. Well, FDR was somebody, uh, you know, like him or hate him. He kept track of things. He was a hands-on president. Uh, he read several newspapers a day. He was, he was, had multiple sources of information that took different points of view. And he had uh, sources of information that were urging him not to intern Japanese Americans. They included none other than his attorney general, Francis Biddle. They included FBI director J. Edgar Hoover. They also included Secretary of Interior Harold Ickes. And there were a lot of people that just didn't think this was a good idea, and he went ahead anyway. Now, FDR is often depicted as a hands-on president, as mm -hmm. a, that's, that's the selling point for people that, that are fans that he, he take, he's a take charge kind of guy that he knows what he's about. And mm -hmm. he does. Um, and, uh, that, uh, you know, he's not, he's not going to be manipulated by anyone, but when it comes to Japanese internment, he is depicted as a kind of clueless, guy that's a creature of events the sort of well-meaning but he's got all these other things on his mind when if you look at fdr's record uh he had always had a kind of suspicious attitude towards japanese americans he'd written op-eds in the 1920s for a george paper in which he said california they're right to uh prevent the japanese immigrants from owning land they're right to ban interracial marriage their right to uh, U.S. is right to stop Japanese immigration because you don't want those two races mixing. In the 1930s, as president, he uh, at a at a you know private comments, he said, "Well, if we ever get an attack on the United States by Japan, what we should immediately do is uh, put Japanese Americans." who met Japanese ships, met sailors, you know, when they were in American harbors and things, put them in, to his words, concentration camps. And he was not shy about using that terminology, and he used mm -hmm. it all the way to the end of this whole experience, nearly the end. He used it in 19, late 1944 in a press conference, that term. So he knows what's going on. He has other people urging him not to do this. He does it anyway. So is he a hands-on leader or isn't he? I think when it comes to Japanese and German, he's a hands-on leader. But he's very good about kind of handing off, oh, I don't know, authority in some sense to third parties, uh, to people in the military and so forth. 
but really he's kind of that's his his method fdr is very much into plausible deniability um and and that is an example now there one argument that's made is there was such overwhelming public support for this actually there wasn't there was a poll taken uh internal federal poll in february that's the same month that he late in the month that he did interment uh and it said Basically, Americans were kind of satisfied with the way things were as far as Japanese Americans. Uh, uh, Newspapers in California, their initial response, this is California, was Mm -hmm. these are citizens. Uh, There's no big deal here. FDR could have made a statement. He could have won PR points had he made this a speech and said, we care so much about the four freedoms. We care so much that we are you know, our Japanese Americans, they're loyal, they're they're going to be, their rights are going to be protected. We're not like the Nazis. We're not like the Japanese government. We will protect their rights. And in fact, people were urging FDR to make such comments. He never did. He let hysteria kind of develop. He handed it over to the military. He, he was hands-on in the sense of he knew what they were doing, and he signed off on it, of course. And it's very cleverly written document is Executive Order 9066. What's interesting about it is it never uses the term Japanese or Japanese Americans, not once. Mm -hmm. And so Congress had to fund this, and they said, well, you're talking about other persons? Who are these people? It's like the Constitution's references to slavery in a way. And uh, they all knew what, what it was, but he never mentioned it. It was very interesting the way it was written. And it was written in an open-ended way that, as FDR himself said, this will enable us to intern Japanese Americans in Hawaii. And after he issued his famous executive order, for quite some time he said, I've always believed we should intern Japanese Americans in Hawaii. What would that have meant? That's 40% of the population of Hawaii, okay, for one thing. So what is how is he going to do this? He was going to transport all the Japanese population, man, women, and children, to one of the smaller islands. And uh, finally, the commander on the ground kind of stepped in and basically, subtly, he didn't want to do it. He said, well, gee, you know, isn't that going to cost a lot of money? Don't we have ships fighting in Midway and places like that? Or don't we need those transport ships for other purposes? And the logistics and the, the consequences of the Hawaiian economy would have been devastating. So for all those reasons, it didn't happen. But FDR goes in print, and no one, you know, very, well, this, I would say no one, but this is not well known, that he wanted to intern the Japanese Americans in Hawaii. He really pushed that idea uh, very much, and they didn't do it for logistical reasons, basically. And political so, reasons, they're, they're political power in Hawaii. They're 40% mm. of the population, God's sakes, you know. <laughs> hey, David, so maybe before we delve into this a little bit more, can you just yeah. step back and just the big picture? So it, it, what, it got implemented, did you say February of 1942? That's right. Well, more, than two mon- more than two months after Pearl Harbor. So mm-hmm. that was a long time, and it was time enough. There was initial hysteria for that to kind of mm-hmm. die down, and which it, ha- which it was dying down by that point. You know, the initial reaction of shock and anger and surprise, it's still there, mm-hmm. but it's not there to the extent it was on December 7th. And then ballpark, how many people are we talking about and how long were they in- interned? Uh, about 120,000 and about two thirds of those are American citizens. And the way they do it is they, um, they intern them, uh, they, they name areas of the country where most Japanese are, such as the West Coast, uh, much of the West Coast. That's where the bulk of the Japanese American population were. So interestingly enough, there are Japanese scattered in places like Idaho who were not interned. They were mistreated and so forth. But if you were a Japanese American who happened to live in New York, you were not interned. Uh, but if you were living on the West Coast where they live generally, uh, you know, you were. And so they said all persons designated you know, uh, whose removal is necessary. That's the language that's used. And, of course, they knew it was Japanese-Americans. And when you get to the actual enforcement orders by the military, that's one of the reasons the military is blamed a lot, because those orders are specific. They say 
These are the implementation orders. They say anyone of Japanese ancestry, who would that include? It included orphanage orphans in uh, Japanese uh, ancestry in American orphanages. So anybody that is of Japanese ancestry, very broad. And the people sometimes say, well, there was stuff going on with the Germans and Italians and internment camps. Yes, there was. And I think, you know, that's a dark side of American history. But you don't, you're not interning uh, Frank Sinatra's family or Joe DiMaggio's family or Dean Martin's family, right? You're mm -hmm. not interning everybody of Italian ancestry. I don't care who you were if you lived in that area where the bulk of the Japanese Americans lived on the continent, you're interned. Yeah, you know, celebrity, nobody, whatever. You're put there. Okay, and then were there any uh, damages, or I don't know if they use the term reparations, was there any kind of compensation afterward, or was it just like, hey, well, you know, we were at war, and your government attacked us, so there you go. Many years later, of course, there was, I think in the 80s, 70s and 80s, there, was, uh, there were some uh, payments made. Uh, I don't know how much, but again, it, you know, wasn't up to the level and, you know, the psychological level here, you know, uh, you, you create some real childhood traumas because mm. all pets had to be destroyed. For example, all property had to be liquidated. You could only take, uh, you know, things like bed clothes and, you know, a few personal possessions. You couldn't take much there. So you had to sell this at, 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 at fire, you know, house, you know, uh, prices and a lot of people snatched up those properties and of course a lot of those are prime properties you know ended up being prime agricultural properties properties in los angeles and so forth so there was some reparations if you want to call pay but they were very specific and i you know i don't have at my fingertips the amounts but mm -hmm. you know it wasn't anything you know okay. comparable <laughs> all right so that that's an element too that like i've never had never thought through before so people they're told, yeah, you got to, we're routing you up. You got to come to this camp. And then they're also, so you got to sell your, like if they lived in a house, they had to sell that too. Or you mean more like commercial property? I don't think, I don't know if you had to sell it. So I suppose if you could find somebody to manage your property or something like that, but of course the property was going to go to pot. Um, you, you know, you had to pay taxes on the property and so Oh, I, I see what you're saying. So the point yeah. is being, Hey, if you're going to be detained for an indefinite amount of, you know, while the war is going on, you probably don't want to just go in while well, everyone hates your guts and just leave your house sitting there unattended because you might yeah, as well try to get I something for it. As yeah. I understand it, again, you're you're asking me some specific questions I should mm -hmm. know ready answers to. But I think basically that's the way it was, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, somebody would take care of your property or something like that. You know, yeah. you didn't literally have to sell, but, you know, your whole family's being taken. Right, right. right? So in practice, yeah. And yeah, then everyone's doing it all at the same time. Yeah, now, I will say this. There wasn't, you know, this sort of formal apologies and all that till much, much later, decades later. But really, I would say very soon, even before the end of World War II, there's a lot of people that say, boy, that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of regret. And Earl Warren you know, had been governor of California and been instrumental in the whole thing. He like welcomed the back and, you know, made a big deal about this. Uh, so uh, there were, there were a lot of second thoughts by the end of the war. Roosevelt, this is one of the indictments of him. Let's assume mm -hmm. we say, all right, hysteria, let's buy into that theory. If that theory is true, he keeps them there. In 1944, this is long after America's, you know, on the offensive and so forth in winning the war. Um, and uh, this is long after, by the way, Japanese Americans are recruited to fight in their own units for the United States and are very successful. He is being urged in 1944 by top people in the administration, again, people like Ickes and uh, Biddle and so forth, saying, well, Mr. President, you know, the crisis time is over with. Can't we release them? And he would just put it off. And he'd talk about things like the California primaries coming up, mm -hmm. right? And it was clear, these statements from insiders, that he was thinking about the electoral consequences. So he kept them there all the way through the presidential campaign. Then he knew that the Supreme Court was going to rule on it. So this is like in December 44. So he got ahead of the game and announced 
well, we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to wind down the, the camps. It was sort of like it was already going to happen, likely, um, and his he sort of gets ahead of that decision after the election. Right, right. Yeah, and, um, and he sort of has this, well, some people have told me it's no longer necessary, and, you know, maybe, uh, maybe we can release them. And, of course, people have been telling them that for a long time, right? He was disingenuous basically lying because people would say, we don't have to have them there anymore. Even a lot of people that have been for the idea thought it was, you let them go now. Come on. Yeah. Um, no, they didn't. I mean, and, and really the camps remained, they wind wound down. So I don't think the last people inmates, if you want to call them that, I think that's a good term. We're not out of the camps till about 1946. So they, you know, wound out slowly. Yeah. Right. Right. So after his death, you know, he still mm-hmm. had people in the camps. And, it, you know, well, after the war is over. <laughs> yeah. He died in, after the war is over. He died in April 45. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think as disturbing as that, that is uh, certainly for those who are, are big fans of FDR and, you know, what a great progressive they think he was. Uh, there is, you can say, well, you know, Japan, the Japanese forces bombed Pearl Harbor. Hawaii wasn't a state at that point, which, you know, I remind people at some point. But um, you, in your book, you cover all sorts of things that happened, like, in the 30s. So this isn't just merely an aberration that you could you could attribute to. Well, you know, there's a war going on that, uh, for example, can you speak a bit? I was intrigued about the, uh, the FCC and how the Roosevelt administration would use that to chill dissent. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you bring up about the the Japanese. I thought that was such a well-known story. And my initial plan in the book was not to even include it because I'd mm-hmm. say, well, other people have covered it, you know, cite that. David Thoreau, the independence to late David Thoreau came mm-hmm. to me and said, David, you have to have a chapter on that. He was so right. Oh, definitely. Because yeah. I learned how it's connected to these other things. Uh, I also learned some new things about it that I wasn't aware of. Um, so it was necessary. However, okay, I would put, I would say it's like a puzzle. If you're going to look at FDR's civil liberties record, the big gigantic piece is Japanese internment, no doubt about it. But it's one of many pieces in the puzzle. Mm-hmm. All the other pieces are inter are interconnected. So you asked about the FCC. Well, this was an interesting story too because I thought, well, I'm going to limit this. I mean, this the focus of this book is FDR. So, uh, you know, start 1933, right? FDR and radio. And I said, no, can't do that because the political context for radio had already been determined. FDR exploited that context, but it had already been determined. It had been determined uh, in 19, well, it made officially determined, I guess, 1927, when we created the Federal Radio, the, the Federal Radio Commission was created on one of the great small government presidents of American history, Calvin Coolidge, one of the biggest leaps forward in governmental control. Um, And it was recognized that way at the time. People said this is one of the the biggest pieces of things that ever happened. And what Coolidge did basically, or what is, he signed off on it, but the guy that really was behind it was his secretary of commerce, Herbert Hoover. And what it did was uh, basically said, okay, the radio, the airwaves, Radio airways belong to the public, the mm-hmm. government, the government controls. And so we're going to have, you know, the, we're going to set up this commission. What we're going to do is we're going to call down the numbers of stations. So they cut several hundred, 27, 28. These included socialist stations. These included labor union stations. These included political stations. Uh, there was a wide diversity of different kinds of stations up till 1927. They call them down, they reduce them, and then they, through various things like the equal time rule and other requirements, they try to make them generic. The federal government pushes to make them very similar, right? Oh, you have a certain number of amount of news, certain amount of entertainment. If you have political stuff, you're going to be careful with that. You're going to provide equal time. You're, 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 you're not going to let this be a political platform, that kind of thing. So, all right, that happened in 27, but what did you have before that? Well, others have written about this. Murray Rothbard wrote about this, for example. And that's sort of where I first found out about it. Others have written about it. Others wrote about it at the time. It was no mystery. That what you had is de facto property rights system developing 
in the early 1920s, which meant essentially you could get a license. And then the federal government say, all right, you've got a license for a radio station on a certain airwave, right? Uh, 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 wavelength. Um, and uh, this is your wavelength and, and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, essentially it, people would buy and sell these like property, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so you had a property rights regime. And as a result of that, there was very little federal censorship. The federal government had virtually no power to censor. Uh, you know, it was very limited in, in any case. It had much, there was much greater power of, of governmental censorship in the print press because you had prior restraint laws. So really in the early 20s, up till 27 or so, radio was freer than the print press. Mm -hmm. I think you could make a good argument for that. So it was a very free system. There were people like uh, 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 Herbert Hoover that didn't like that because he thought this is the public's airwaves. Uh, we can't just, you know, commercialize it. Um, you know, um, they didn't like the fact that you'd have specialization. You'd have market, seg markets, market segmentation. Like you'd have a religious station. You'd have a socialist station, a labor union, et cetera. You had an evangelist. You had, you had tended to specialize. They didn't like that. They wanted to be generic. They thought that that's kind of unseemly. So Hoover, basically a secretary of the commerce, things were kind of proceeding, you know, working pretty well. But he does something uh, uh, basically in response to a court decision, which he argu arguably had... Um, uh, encouraged called the Zenith decision. And basically Hoover says, well, his interpretation of this decision, which was bogus, the federal government has no power at all anymore to designate wavelengths or, you know, all we can do is if someone wants a license, we give it to them, but we don't have a power to enforce wavelengths, which it did before. I could say, don't interfere with this wavelength mm -hmm. and it could take action. Things were pretty stable. And so it was chaos. But as it's been called by historians like uh, Thomas Has Hazlitt, he says, basically, it's engineered chaos. Hoover wanted chaos. And, and that's what happens. This creates enough incentive for the federal government to step in. And that eventually comes about with the Federal Communications Act. Because they said, we got all this chaos. But there's an interesting story there after Hoover's chaos because what starts happening is the common law starts asserting himself so you're starting itself so you're starting to get uh like the chicago tribune owned a station they say look this is they brought a property rights case he said we were the first to use this wavelength therefore we've homesteaded the wavelength therefore it's our property and it won it won a case in um i think i don't know if it was in the federal district courts but it won a case that was kind of a big precedent um, and a lot of people hey, predicted hey David, can I, can I stop you that, just that make sure. would, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, people it's complicated. Are, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. But just so they get the con, cause you know, at this point, like everyone's listening to serious, mm. the point being like, if somebody's using one frequency and then some else sets up, up like a quote pirate radio station, yeah. using the same, then the people trying to listen, it's like getting crowded out. And so it's exactly that that's, that's what we're talking about, right? That's the basic thing. And so can you use the force of law to stop somebody else from broadcasting on the range of the radio spectrum that, exactly. you know, you've, you've, you've been doing it all along. Yeah. And the federal government's uh, pre Hoover, uh, mm -hmm. pre Hoover's decision uh, basically was doing that. They were It was like property rights. All the federal government did is essentially was, a register your license, and then you'd have a, assign you a wavelength, and they protect mm. the wavelength. Yeah, and you could buy or sell, and that was chaos after that because Hoover said, "Well, we don't have that power," and it was right, a bogus right. interpretation. But mm. then the market, the common law, starts asserting itself, and people have the bright idea, like, "Well, let's take this to court," and they were starting mm -hmm. to win, right. but it was too late. It was too late. This chaos. And the momentum for federal control was too strong, and it never was able to take hold. But it was going to happen. And it was predicted that this is likely to happen. This was the solution that a lot of people thought was going to end the chaos. Homesteading, property rights in the electro 
magnetic spectrum, essentially. But FCC precluded that. Federal Radio Commission, same thing. It, you know, it just changed its name later to FCC, basically. And uh, so you got a governmental control, essentially. And then Roosevelt comes in. Hoover's kind of inept in using radio for political purposes. And Roosevelt is a master of using radio for political purposes. He's got charisma. People said he would have been a natural talent in radio if he had not been president. He is able to go to the fireside chats, which are a lot like Trump's tweets early on. Mm -hmm. He goes directly to people. He goes around the media who he hates. He hates the print media. Sounds a lot like Trump talking about the fake, fake, you know, uh, news and things like that. And so he goes around them. But he's able to do other things like, for example, there's a kind of you know, you, you have a system where you have to renew licenses. Stations have to renew new licenses every six months. So it said they're like in terror. Who would we make a mistake that would get the government to say you're violating, you know, public, uh, uh, you know, your public violating the public interest, which is written in your, your license. And, uh, so they're terrified. So they, 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 they avoid doing anything that could, uh, alienate the government. You got a kind of budding equal time rule where it's basically, you've also got rules that the FCC and the National Broadcasting Association is enforcing in cooperation at the FCC that, that against, for example, you know, if I, if I was a millionaire and wanted to buy a radio station and, and broadcast my theories about politics or whatever, that was, that was under, that was prohibited. You couldn't do that. So and and you got a lot of behind the scenes things. Give you a sense what I'm talking about. In by 1938, there was not a single anti New Deal, anti FDR radio commentator on network radio, which is where most people get their news. By contrast, the print press is oh, uh, is uh, mostly anti Roosevelt, mostly anti Roosevelt, not radio. How does that happen? Well, they're forced off the air. And one of the big cases of this is a guy named Bo Carter, one of the more popular radio broadcasters on network radio. I think he was on NBC several times a week. Very influential. Had been supporter of Roosevelt, but he turned against him after the 36th election. And basically, they're, they, they're trying to find any way to get him off the air. They, Roosevelt investigates his citizenship status because he was Canadian born. He couldn't find anything there. They look into his taxes. They can't find anything about this guy. And so eventually they go to the sponsors. And one of the big sponsors is Marjorie Merriweather Post, you know, the Post family. Mm -hmm. uh, her husband was the Russian ambassador, Soviet ambassador, kind of a pro-communist guy, interestingly enough. But she owned the Miralago property originally. Right. So okay. she got money and she's one of the big sponsors of Bo Carter, her, her product. And so they basically go and she's a big Democratic supporter, big Democratic donor. So they go to her and then they put pressure through her and other advertisements on Carter, say he needs to tone it down. He needs to stop this stuff. And then eventually he sort of He's forced off the air. And there are no anti-FDR radio commentators left, but he was a very powerful one. He's kind of forgotten figure now, but really was, you know, tremendously, uh, you know, had very high ratings and so forth. And besides, you know, so that one could obviously say that that certainly is not in the spirit of uh, open discussion of opposing views and whatever, but you say, well, if they just leaned on some donors, okay, but even though they might not have found it written out somewhere in black and white, you also believe like the actual uh, non-renewal of licenses, like certain stations were literally prohibited in the sense that they didn't have their licenses renewed. Yeah. You've got it. It's, it's hard to simplify. You got a wider range of things. You've got things like the, the renewal. You've got things like um, uh, you've got things like the national broadcasting code, which is a private code that prohibits things like, um, oh, like I said, uh, some millionaire buying a station, right? Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it tends to prohibit things like, uh, uh, and the FCC kind of 
helps support this. And the FCC has its own rules, kind of an equal time rule. In fact, you have a very famous decision at the end of this period, which is called the Mayflower decision, where basically, you know, uh, you're not supposed to, a radio station is not supposed to editorialize, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't editorialize on the behalf of the station. Um, so you get a lot of restrictions that make it very hard for anybody to have sort of a political point of view, right? Someone like Elon Musk, if he was a radio baron, he'd, he, you know, he couldn't do it, right? There mm. are so many rules and that kind of thing to make it very difficult. So it's a very controlled medium. It's hard to generalize about it. There's the FCC. There's the kind of uh, strong arming of advertisers. There's the National Association of Broadcasting Code, which has given its, it's basically created to appease the FCC. There's kind of equal time rules that are developing that you go way back to the early 30s. Um, and there's a kind of terror that people in the networks are constantly going to the administration saying, is this okay? Can we do this? Do you want us to fire this guy? Do you want to fire this guy? You know, they're very concerned. Now, if you look at the kind of smaller independent stations, they're a little freer, uh, but they don't have the listenership. The networks have the, the dominate in terms of listenership. So it's not a hundred percent because you, you'll have lo these local stations. In fact, there's an anti new deal radio show that I've written about called the American family Robinson, which is sort of through early version of syndication is carried by a lot of these smaller independent stations. So there's stuff going on. That's interesting. I always wondered if Ayn Rand had, you know, heard these shows cause they sound a lot like, you know, stuff she's arguing. Um, um, very, you know, and initially at least that it's watered down towards the end because even they get worried about this. They get defensive about this because they're accused of, you know, promoting this, this, this point of view. And they, they water it down eventually too, but that was kind of limited to these smaller independent stations where you might have some stuff like that happening, but network radio is, 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 is controlled completely. Mm -hmm. What I liked, uh, one, one of the things I f saw, you made the point that Roosevelt typically was pretty careful about, you know, plausible deniability and all these yeah. different things. And we can kind of just look at the results and you don't, you know, it's hard to pit. But you pointed out that um, he did have a recording device, if you remember the part I'm talking about, installed. That's the, and then the one, was the a, Wilkie affair. Yeah, that was one of my, I think, one of the best stories out there because how do you find out about Roosevelt? Is it in print? Usually not. It's where people would, you know, his close advisors would meet with him or other people. Roosevelt might have a few drinks, get relaxed and start saying things, mm -hmm. start admitting things. You'd have that happen. And you can piece that together. But this is one that's quite interesting. Roosevelt had a taping system installed in the White House. No, and people, you didn't ask people's permission or anything like that. So he'd tape a lot of things, including uh, news conferences, but they left the machine on. So it picked up a lot of stuff. Um, and he wanted to tape news conferences because he, he thought he was being misquoted a lot. So he said, mm -hmm. I can, you know, I can look back at this and, and, it, but it was, but a lot of, you know, it's oval office conversations were recorded and so forth. But this is an interesting one where Roosevelt says, you know, uh, there's a story out there that Wendell Wilkie, the Republican candidate in 1940, is having an affair with this woman that was, uh, actually, she was Isabel Patterson's boss at the, uh, was it the New York, oh, God, you, New York uh, Evening News, I forget, but it was like a big, big sort of uh, New York Post or New York Evening News, something like that. But she was sort of, uh, you know, it was a very powerful figure, and she was having an affair with Wilkie, all right? So this is during the campaign, and Roosevelt's sort of joking about it with one of his advisors. And he's a wor he's worried, you know. There, there's, there are polls early in that campaign that show Wilkie making this a very competitive race. And Roosevelt sort of said, well, y you know, here's what we can do. Uh, this All this stuff about the affair. Um we can just spread the news, but we don't do it, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have our top people do it. Certainly, I'm not going to do it, but we have people, as he said, down the line. 
down the line spreading this rumor that uh probably true that wilkie was having this affair we'll just spread it down the line of course we don't want to have anything to do with it and, and it's very interesting and i call it the a rare example the unfiltered roosevelt and you don't have a lot of those you have some mostly mm -hmm. in print but here's one where you can actually hear him um uh basically this is how he operates he's very different than trump trump will say you know that guy ought to you know whatever he'll say something really right, negative right. about any opponent he'll just go like a bull in a china shop goes mm -hmm. overboard right and doesn't mean it half the time sometimes he might i don't know but roosevelt is not that way roosevelt has a subtlety to him a sense of humor uh he can even make you feel like enjoy being attacked for a little bit um you know his very famous phallus speech right you know he, he's he's very good at that kind of thing and in that speech for example he doesn't really name names as i recall he talks about those republicans right now they're attacking my little dog phala right and he he'll, he'll he, he's very good at that kind of thing He'll, and he's ideological. A lot of people see him as non kind of this guy that's just uh, not, not, I think he's extremely ideological, but he's a smart politician as well. He's pragmatic in the sense that he'll, you know, if something isn't paying politically, he'll, he'll trim his sails if he has to. But uh, um, yeah, I, I guess I'm trying to answer your question saying his style is very different than Trump and it works to Roosevelt's benefit, I think. Well, yeah, but I liked it. It resonated with me that you know, because I, like I say, I did some a, a book on the New Deal, and that what you said that most of what we know about what happened behind closed doors, there's no paper trail. It's just people later in their own memoirs and stuff, and what they recollect. Because I remember one once they were like fixing the price of gold, and I forget who the guy was, but somebody said something like, uh, "If the American public had realized." you know, we were behind closed doors and how Roosevelt would come up with what the price of gold we were going to fix it at that day, they would be shocked. In other words, like, you yeah. know, occasionally, like, he, like he, Roosevelt like might have had a drink or two in him. It was a just, lucky, I think he said yeah. it's a lucky number, you know? Yeah, so he, yeah, he just say, like stuff yeah. like that about what we're going to do, yeah. like it almost, almost getting intoxicated by the power of, we could just go set the price of gold. Like this is invigorate. And the guy just saying, if, if people saw what was actually how we were coming with those numbers, like they, you know, they'd be shocked. So, um, can you maybe talk a bit about, you also mentioned one of your topics is the uh, the wiretaps and audits of political uh, adversaries. Yeah. Um, um, uh, yeah, just about everybody uh, uh, had their phone, who was any sort of political opponent in Roosevelt would have their, their phone tapped. That was just standard operating procedure. And uh, one guy, uh, I forget who he was, this is reported by a former Chicago Tribune reporter. And I guess he went down because Chicago Tribune was an anti new deal paper. Mm -hmm. So he got some friend of his, who was a detective and they went down in the basement and they, you know, it's all very primitive. Right. And they saw all the taps on the phone and there were like seven of them, <laughs> right. From all these different government agencies and, and, and that kind of thing. So Roosevelt was very much doing that. Um, and, and these are kind of unauthorized operations. I mean, you know, they're not legal, you know, he just, he just does it. Doesn't have, you know, we just, and then there's a uh, tax audits. Roosevelt is constantly uh, pressuring his secretary of the treasurer and others to say, look into this guy's taxes, look into. So if you were a critic of Roosevelt during this period, and a lot of them were remarkably careful because your top marginal rate is like, incredible you know mm -hmm. in excess of 80 percent 90 percent right and so you had to be incredibly careful to get every legal shelter you could get because you had to get shelters or you'd be you'd, you'd be a fool to pay those marginal rates and very few people did but you had to be very careful not to give the government any opportunity to go after you um and of course that is that is kind of well known it's sort of well known, uh, this aspect of Roosevelt, but you got to piece a lot of it together from accounts of other people because a lot of this isn't recorded anywhere. We know what happened, but a lot of it's kind of anecdotal, but it's powerful mm. anecdotal evidence. Um, and it's, if you're talking about surveillance, though, the big the biggie, which maybe you'll ask me about, 
is 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 the uh, the black committee. Yeah, yeah, and, well, uh, yeah was literally that was the next one. So if you want to go into that and Western Union and so forth. Yeah, that is one that's less well known and and and, and perhaps because it's so unfamiliar, the technique is is so different uh, that that you see subsequent administrations use. Uh, partly that's due to the technology. Okay, there was a Roosevelt was uh, really riding high in 1933-34. Very popular. Um, people were willing to give him most of what he wanted. Although I think there were even limits to how much they'd tolerate, even then. But um, by 35, there is rising opposition to the New Deal. And uh, and so much so that there are polls in, in late as mid-1936 that actually show Roosevelt losing the 1936 election. We're talking about good polls. Well, you know, polls that were respected, you know, that probably were accurate to a great extent. Um, so he is getting, he's, his popularity ratings falling. He's losing elections. There are a lot of these by elections, you know, where you have open seats. Mm -hmm. He's losing those Democrats are losing, loses control of the New York state assembly for God's sakes. That's pretty big. And so they're getting worried that maybe we're in trouble for the 36 election. So they, they come up with the idea, Roosevelt and his inner circle, we have to have an investigation of the anti new deal people. We have to discredit these people. And so what do they do? They couch it in terms of lobbying. They say, well, they're lobbies, right? And they count and they define lobbies in the broadest popular term pop terms. So what we're doing is a lobby, right? Lobbying, because we're discussing ideas could even mm -hmm. be more innocuous than what we're talking about. And those might have an effect on public opinion that it's called indirect lobbying. So that's what we're engaging in. You don't have to go to Congress or anything like that. So, so that's what they're doing. So they set up a committee in the Senate and they say, well, who are we going to have chair this thing? And they, the guy they appoint is Hugo Black, who's a senator from Alabama, an attack dog for the administration, a man who could teach Joe McCarthy lessons, uh, very effective. And he's got the support of the president, which, of course, Joe, Mc Joe McCarthy never did ever. And so they, they recruit him, you know, Roosevelt's henchmen go to black and say, okay, will you do this? And black says, sure. And black is, is, is going to always attack for the administration, investigate. He's a kind of populist, but he's, he's controlled. He's not like Huey Long. He's not going to go off on his own. He's a loyalist. And so they set up a committee and then black calls in these anti new deal people. And he, he grills them and he scores some points, but they score some points too by comparing him to the Russian secret police. And they get some sympathy, so it's mm -hmm. not necessarily going well. And so somebody comes up with the idea, well, what if we got a hold of their private telegrams and then we brought them in? So, ah, that sounds like a good idea. But how do you do that? Well, it turns out there was a law and the law was, it was administered by the FCC at this point. And it was that private telegram companies had to keep copies of all telegrams. And uh, how important is that? Well, over 50% of long distance communication in the 1930s is private telegrams. And they are like email at the time. They're like text messages at the time. Very close comparison in many cases. Businesses would often have their own telegraphers, for example. They were instantaneous, almost instantaneous. People would say things in telegrams that they would not say in letters. Uh, they would they would let their hair down. They mm -hmm. were constantly sending them out. They wouldn't save them very often. They were of the moment, reflecting passions of the moment. Um, so uh, basically, that was a law. Now, what? what uh, okay, how could that? You you had to keep copies. So Western Union, which is the big one. They had to keep copies of all telegrams. So how did the government get access to that? The only way they can get it is a subpoena that's very targeted. And those are controversial. But they basically say, well, what we'll do, Black goes to the committee, says, we want you to give, I want you guys, Western Union, to give me all, here's how one thing he's asked for. All telegrams sent in and out of Washington, D.C. to every single member of Congress. And he goes to Western Union. And he says, I want all those. 
Well, she said, no. I mean, do you have a subpoena? And are you going to name an, you know, one person you want them for, maybe a court, if a court orders us to? He said, no, I want them. Western Union refuses. Then the FCC goes to FCC and they order uh, Western Union to provide these telegrams. Western Union could have fought it, but they decided, uh, this doesn't look good. We would just let, let, we'll just cooperate. Everything's going to be quiet, right? So they let in black staffers. They let in uh, people from the FCC and others, you know, who are working for, you know, the committee's interest. And they start going through these long, these big piles of telegrams. Uh, every, you know, for examples, like I said, starting correspondence, telegram correspondence between every member of Congress and every co co constituent for like a nine month period. They start going through. They go through thousands a day, and it ends up being at least three million. Now it's mass surveillance, mm -hmm. and they're instructed. Black instructs the searchers to say, "Well, if you see something of private information, you know, between, for example, husband and wife, uh, you know, go past that, right? Just mm -hmm. just look for stuff having to do with lobbying. And of course, lobbying could be any sort of expression of political ideas." right? Very broadly defined. They go through these and then they start expanding it. They get greedy. So Black will go there and say, I want, you know, he'll identify individuals, regardless of whether the communications are happening through Washington. I want all the telegrams sent to and from this person and this person and this person. They get greedy. So they keep going through more and more and more. And then he's able to ambush witnesses, by pulling out these telegrams. I think some of them got in the hands of Roosevelt, by the way, from, from things that were said. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're out there. And the witnesses are blindsided sometimes. And Black is able to kind of go a bit more uh, on the offensive. Western Union, though, eventually the executives there get up really worried about this. And they start telling people, your telegrams are being searched by the federal government. And uh, they start telling people. One of the people they tell is a guy named Newton Baker, who was Wilson's secretary of war. And Baker was a kind of moderate, easygoing guy, a kind of a, a little critical of the New Deal, but a little supportive. You know, he basically wasn't a big threat. And he is so mad when he finds out about this that he said that if I saw a... Uh, uh, a lynching occur of Senator Black, I would not join the lynching. However, if I saw the uh, the lynchers put a rope around his neck, I would not stop them. <laughs> and so he's upset about this. Another mm -hmm. guy that's upset is very powerful. His name is Silas Strawn. Anyone heard of a law firm in Chicago called Winston? I think it's called Winston and Strawn. Still there. Big law firm. He was... Get you a guy, how important this guy was. He was head of the National Bar Association, American Bar Association. He was head of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He was head of the U.S. Golf Association. This guy oh. was like really interesting <laughs> trifecta. Character. Yeah, trifecta. And uh, he, he, he brings suit. He says, this is violating our uh, Fourth Amendment rights. And they use term privacy, by the way, a lot. Though mm -hmm. the term privacy didn't start with Roe versus Wade. It's used by these people all the time, the right of privacy. And they're, they're saying, you know, you're searching our, our papers. You know, you're violating our Fourth Amendment rights, for example. Uh, you don't have a subpoena, for God's sakes. And uh, Strawn brings suit. Other people bring suit, including William Randolph Hearst. Both win. And basically, Strawn's case is... Is 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 the, the the federal district court said I I I tell Black to hand these back, but I I really don't know if I can do that because Congress has a lot of investigative power and they really do. Congress is a, there's a lot of discretion shown to Congress, but I I will step in even though this is rare for a court to do. The judge says and prohibit them from doing any more of this. And of course Black says, well we've completed our field investigations. Of course he done millions of telegrams so he said all right fine i mean he's upset about it like what do you who do you think you are trying to limit what i want to do as, as an investigator he makes statements like that so these it's a precedent though 
meaning no future congressional committee can do this. It serves as a very powerful precedent. It never goes up to the Supreme Court, but it, it is still a precedent. And so uh, imagine what kinds of powers you know, the congressional committees, investigative committees of the 40s and 50s. Of course, telegrams are less important then. But, you know, tell, but over uh, phones. I mean, it's, you know, you could, you could, you could I, Black could have really, I mean, I would, I would think there would be nothing to stop him from wiretapping phones. I don't think he had the infrastructure to do that, but he had very broad powers and he was using them. And in effect, the court st steps in and says, you can't do that now anymore. So mm -hmm. it's a very important precedent. This is not some small uh, issue. This is headline news. Uh, this is big deal. There are leading commentators in the press like Walter Lippmann. There are leading congressmen, New Deal congressmen, like Emanuel Seller. Very important figure. I still remember him from my youth. Uh, he's quite elderly at the time. I thought this guy's just a Democratic hack. No, it turns out in the 30s, he might have been a hack, but he was like comparing Roosevelt to Mussolini. But he was still a, a New Deal guy. Mm -hmm. So that's what's interesting to me, that a lot of the New Dealers were willing, a lot of people on the left were willing to call Roosevelt out on things like this. The ACLU, they were kind of divided, but a lot of the people in that group were willing to call him out on this stuff. Um, so, and just to um, remind yeah. people, this wasn't because, oh, hey, there's a war going. This was all stemming from Roosevelt was worried about not getting reelected. Yeah, this is 1935. 1936, mm -hmm. right? It's not not even the war clouds even aren't, aren't really on the horizon, I guess you could say. Maybe they are, but I mean, as far as the U.S. government is concerned, it really aren't. Yeah. Well, I think maybe we have time for one more topic. Uh, what about the the sedition trial? What you cover in your last chapter is that something you want to give the quick synopsis of? Yeah. Um, it's it. You know what's interesting about the story is we got a lot here on a lot of issues. Uh, race and, and so forth. We got a lot of in there, but this one you got to talk about. And it was a trial that is very timely. You know, when I started this, which was, I mean, I started to research on this 15 years ago. I never imagined that we would be seeing, I mean, it would have been hard for me to imagine. Sedition trials make a comeback. It was sort of old hat. But these, mm. this trial was a mass sedition trial and it was under a piece of legislation called the Smith Act. And there was a provision in the Smith Act that, that said that, um, well, you can't promote insubordination in the military, right? Because it might interfere with recruiting or something. It's thin as a pretext. So they get the government gets the idea of going after these uh, uh, opponents of Roosevelt. And originally, they wanted to, uh, to go after key people like uh, Charles Lindbergh, uh, like members of Congress. Uh, sound familiar, right? Mm -hmm. But... Uh, there was enough civil libertarianism in the federal government, including Attorney General Biddle, who was willing to get Roosevelt something. He said, no, we don't really have a case. And, and part of the argue, problem with it the, from their standpoint was all these people, the main opponents of Roosevelt, once Pearl Harbor happened, they said, we support the war. We're all in. So what are you going to do? You know, Roosevelt's still mad at them for opposing his policies before the war, but he he can't really make a case now against them that they're doing anything like that now. So they they can't do it. And Roosevelt wants to prosecute these big names, but Biddle pushes back. And so finally, as he he said, he get Biddle sort of authorizes a prosecution of about 32 people from all around the country. So they're scooped up from, oh, I don't know, rural Nebraska. They're scooped up from uh, all over the place, right? And they'd be some guy, some crank very often. It might have some anti-Semitism in them, maybe not, but a lot of them did kind of anti-Semitism, who has a little newsletter. But a lot of the anti-Semitism of these people kind of went back to the kind of the populace and that kind of, some of them, one guy was in his eighties, right? He'd been like, had these sort of views a long time. And these are like kind of cranks. They're, they're not very powerful. They have these little newsletters and stuff, some of the, and they scoop them all up and they don't even know each other. And mm -hmm. they bring them all to Washington and they are accused of being part of a worldwide Nazi conspiracy. And the government is trying to connect these people together into some big plot. And they can't even show that they did anything regarding the military. They can't even make that connection. 
So the government's case is going on and on and on. And initially, this this conspiracy trial, it's called the Great Sedition Trial, 1944, has a lot of public support, a lot of support in the press because it's like, gee, isn't it great that we're giving these people a chance in the court? They wouldn't do it because they're Nazis. And turns out a lot of them really weren't Nazis. You know, they were just kind of cranks and things, um, varied views. And so there's rising opposition, including from a lot of the lawyers who are court appointed, who are pro new deal lawyers Mm -hmm. who, and these guys have their own lawyers. So you got 32 defendants with their lawyers, you know, shouting objections in a small courtroom. The judge is, is kind of a, can't take it. He's getting up there in years, probably at my age, but he's, you know, he can't take it. And he, uh, he eventually, he just dies. Right. And <laughs> had a heart attack and the trial's still going on. And the government's saying, well, what do we do now? And they, and this is 1944. I think he died. Maybe it was 45. I think it was 44. And the government debates about whether to continue the case, but they say, you know, it's too much trouble. And it, it takes a couple of years, but they ultimately dismiss all the charges and it all falls apart and there's never a conviction, but it is a big deal. And, Within a few months of the conclusion of this trial, the death of the judge, you actually start to see the beginnings of the sedition trials under the Smith Act Mm -hmm. of communist figures and pro-communists. And irony, of course, is a lot of these communist types who were prosecuted had supported the sedition trial against Mm -hmm. the right-wingers who they hated. And the communists were just shameless. They they wanted to prosecute. There was a sedition separate trial on sedition charges and other things against the Socialist Workers Party, which were Trotskyites. And the pro-Stalinist Communist Party hated them. That it sicked the government on these uh, these uh, you know political rivals, you know, uh, for essentially the same arguments they were making against them. So it was kind of interesting. Uh, how that all worked, but FDR was sort of willing to give the communists whatever they wanted to a great extent. Mm -hmm. They were seen as allies to the administration, you know, in in that period. And and just to uh, put all that again in sort of the the theme of the book, or one of the themes is that you're saying FDR pushed forward on this in the beginning, even though some of his advisors were telling him, no, there's nothing here. Let's just let this go. And he, so this wasn't, that his his aides were telling him to do is he reluctantly went along with it because he had qualms at sleeping at night knowing he was violating civil liberties. That wasn't what was going on here. That's a very good way you frame that because often people tell me, well, the worst president on civil liberties is Woodrow Wilson, right? For the 20th century, right? And I say no, because Wilson, you would see examples with Wilson where there were attempts to prosecute people for sedition and Wilson would kind of go to bat for them. He would mm-hmm. go to the uh, secretary or to the attorney general and said, yeah, to really prosecute this guy. And the attorney general would say, yeah, we do. And Wilson would defer to them. Now, there were mm-hmm. times when he really went after people like Eugene Debs. I don't want to defend him too much. But you often see that, though, where he would kind of defer. He didn't really mm-hmm. necessarily want to do it. With Roosevelt, he wanted to do it consistently he wanted to go further over and over again than his own attorney general, than his own advisors. That is what you see. He's pushing them to do things they don't want to do. And there is a strong civil liberty consciousness that has arose, partly because of World War I. At that time, a lot of people said, boy, we made a mistake there. We went overboard. Mm -hmm. Partly because of prohibition, all the violations of civil liberties associated with that had an imprint. So if you were going to law school in the 20s and 30s, if you were reading the leading law school texts, like by Zachariah Chafee is a good example, leading text on civil liberties, you took in some of that stuff. So you were kind of reluctant to do this. On Japanese internment, a lot of the top people in the Justice Department, including Biddle, but people under him were even more radical in saying, we don't think this is a good idea. So there was a civil liberties consciousness that had seeped in. And Roosevelt is, is is at odds with that. Um, so yeah, that's that's an interesting point. So I, on that standard, I would actually say he's worse. Now it doesn't look as bad outside of Japanese internment be, because there aren't as many people being thrown in jail. But that's partly because there just aren't many people opposing the war anymore. 
There were a mm-hmm. lot of people opposing the war in World War I, but after Pearl Harbor, very few people were opposing the war, at least openly. And so what are you going to do? You know, Roosevelt can't do much. So they go after those few people, including some pacifists that were still making anti-war comments. And I've got some good examples there of a pacifist pro-peace paper that's anti-New Deal. And they are, their mailing rights are taken away during the war. And they don't do anything, you know, revolutionary, or they don't go and urge people not to register or anything, maybe in the abstract. But they aren't involved in anything like that, but they go after them. Uh, the Socialist Workers Party, they suspend their newsletter, partly because, you know, they, you know they're against all wars, they say, because mm. it's the capitalist war. But, they do, you know, it's just a general statement. Um, so there are just fewer fish to catch in the same nets, I guess is another way you can say it, because everybody's on board after Pearl Harbor. So it's not that the standards are, are more pro-civil liberty. They're not. I think the standards are anything worse, certainly no better than they had been, but you just don't have as many people to go after, you know, so you can't do it. Right. And there's pushback. There's pushback. So big picture takeaway is that uh, Roosevelt's, it's not just that his economics were flawed, you know, from most right-wingers' perspectives, but he was also not even good on civil liberties. No, he was terrible on civil liberties. And, you know, I think that maybe there's a, uh, Roosevelt is still regarded as one of the top presidents, greatest, number two, number three, number one sometimes in polls. But I think he's vulnerable. You talk to anybody who's a Roosevelt defender and you got the information on, on Japanese internment, mm. they run away. They try to kind of defend it, but they, they run away from it. Um, it's half-hearted. You look at his record on all sorts of things, race and so forth, it's terrible. Um, so I think that the cancellation, in some sense, yeah. of Roosevelt <laughs> will happen. Uh, I think there's a good chance it will happen because he's got such a horrible record on so many things related to civil liberties issues, related to race. Yeah, yeah. And one of the uh, books that will now help usher in that cancellation, perhaps, is David Beto's book, which we've been discussing, The New Deal's War on the Bill of Rights, The Untold Story of FDR's Concentration Camps, Censorship, and Mass Surveillance. So, David, thanks so much for writing the book and for your time here discussing it. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.